Well, good morning and, and welcome. Thank you for getting out on this foggy day and, and joining us here to talk about heat pumps. Uh, my name is Gene Hanlon. I'm chair of the uh, Green Sanctuary Committee for the Unitarian Church of, of Lincoln, as well as help coordinate the Coalition for Environmental Improvement, two of the sponsors here for the event. I also wanted to thank Conservation Nebraska for helping plan this event as well as handling the registration for us. Uh, so, so how we're going to do this, we have actually five speakers uh, today, but before I do the introductions, I'd like to just get a, a better idea of, of, of the audience, and, and I'd, I'd like to know, are there any um, HVAC contractors in the audience? Two? Okay, great. Great. Thank you for coming. The um, homeowners? Most, yeah. most of you? The, uh, any renters at all? All right. Um, the, it's good that we, how about landlords? Any landlords here besides Kurt? Over here? Great. Um, how, how many of you actually have installed a heat pump in, in your home? So about, thank you, thank you. Um, so how we're going to work this, um, uh, the, the, uh, need to advance the slides here. That, uh, the workshop program, um, we're just going to rotate um, ac across these tables for speakers. And um, as I said, we've got five speakers to the, today, and we've, we've got allocated a few minutes after each presentation for questions. So feel free to ask those questions. Uh, we hope to end at 11.30, if not sooner. We'll see how many questions we have. And after the event, uh, if those interested can see, our, see the, the church uh, has uh, installed a five-ton commercial heat pumps. You can look at that outside as well as our electric backup and our electric uh, water heater, heat pump water heater, if you'd like, after the meeting. So let me uh, begin with our uh, speakers. Our first speaker is Ken Haar. He's the former, um, a former city council member and former Nebraska State Legislature for, for District 21 here in Lincoln. Ken's main focus in the legislature was education, climate change, and wind and solar renewable energy. And he is also a strong advocate, heat pump advocate. Uh, following Ken will be Ben Shobe. He was elected to the Lincoln City Council in 2017 and re-elected in 2021. Originally from Kentucky, he has lived in Lincoln since 1998 and is a program analyst for the Nebraska Department of Labor. Benny holds an MA in sociology from Western Kentucky University and served, <laughs> served, uh, and served on numerous boards and commissions prior to his election. Benny enjoys telling people that, that Lincoln has a climate action plan and looks forward to moving forward with many of the initiatives at the city level while encouraging individual and residential engagement. And I'd like to add that um, we would not have the city and LES combo incentive program that you'll learn about later in the program without his strong leadership in, in getting that implemented. Uh, Benny will be followed by Kim Morrow uh, as Chief Sustainability Offer, Officer uh, for the City of Lincoln. Kim works to transition our community to a climate smart future. She leads a wide variety of decarbonization and cl climate resiliency initiatives that aim to make our community more equitable, bolster our economy, improve environmental health, and make Lincoln an even better place to call home. Kim will be followed by Mark Skolnick. He has served as manager of energy services for the Lincoln Electric System since June of 2007. The, depart uh, the department is charged with providing comprehensive and customer experience and solutions for the city of Lincoln's industrial, commercial, businesses, and residential customers. His team is also responsible for administering the utility's energy efficiency, demand response, customer-owned renewables, and emergency technology programs. An Omaha native, Mark holds a Bachelor of Science in Education and a Master's of Education Administration degrees from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He currently serves as a member of the Electric Power Research Institute's Electric Vehicles Advisory Council and president of the Kiwanis Club of Lincoln, Lincoln Center. We will end with another heat pump advocate, Kurt Donaldson. He installed his first air source heat pump in 1975 and first geothermal system in 1985. He continues to own and manage rental properties 
with a variety of HVAC systems from 2014 to present. Um, he has coordinated the installation of geothermal and air source heat pumps here at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln with a, uh, with a benefit of a 25 kilowatt photovoltaic system. Net energy cost for the church in 2024 should be under 50 cents per square foot. So with that, we'll, we'll move to Ken and his presentation. I want to thank everybody at the tables here who has made this heat pump project work. And uh, I'm going to call him Benny because he's a, a good friend of mine. But Benny put money in the budget the last for the biennial budget, a half million dollars to, for the heat pump project. So thank you so much for that. I'd like to start with just a, my own story. Uh, a couple years, well, it was in uh, 2020, our whole HVAC system, we have a 20-year-old house, was starting to get creaky. And so Chris and I decided to go with a ground source, or not a ground source, but just a, a uh, air source heat pump. And I'm going to show you a couple slides quickly. Uh, the red line shows where we changed. And look at the change in those shapes. The blue is the amount of natural gas that we used seasonally. And as you'd expect, the first two years, you can see um, we use m a lot of natural gas in the winter. And then as you get over to the two years with the heat pumps, you can see that those, those peaks are still in the winter, but they're the area is much smaller. And from just these two years, I saved, we saved 52% uh, in natural gas usage. Now, this is our electrical usage over those two years. And as you'd expect, the first two years, the big peaks are in summertime. Um, but look at the last two years. Uh, we have another peak in the winter. Uh, and I'll show you why in a minute. Now, this is a uh, map of Lincoln's temperatures. And right now, my, uh, our heat pump uh, operates any time uh, the temperature is over 20 degrees. It's the red line. So you can see that most that in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I don't have the most efficient air source heat pump, but most of the time, the air source heat pump gives us the heat we need in our home. Yeah. Really, this brochure uh, is all you need to know. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a capsulation of everything you're going to hear today uh, in much, much more detail. But the theme of this really is don't wait until your air conditioner breaks or your HVAC system breaks. Uh, don't wait. Do some planning and educating yourself ahead of time. Uh, and then inside it talks about, and, and again, you'll hear more about this, uh, the, uh, why you shouldn't wait, uh, who to call. And right now, Mark Skolnick with LES uh, will be, I'm giving you his phone number. And... <laughs> He said, if he can't answer the question, he'll pass it along to other staff members. So really, we want to have some sources that you can go to. Uh, could I have one, too? <laughs> okay. uh, some sources to go to. So if you look at that, if you open it up, first of all, a heat pump. Actually, you have a lot of heat pumps in your house already. If you have a refrigerator, it just moves heat from the inside to the outside, from the inside of the refrigerator to, the, to your room. Whereas if you have uh, a gas furnace, it burns. It creates heat. And the older electric furnaces create heat. You know, or the little heater you have maybe where the, where the uh, strip in there turns red because you're running electricity through it. Resistance heat. That's creating heat. The best way to do it is to move heat, and that's what an air pump does. So it's more efficient. Um, 
And then on the right-hand side, again, it shows you the summer operation and the winter operation. It's a little more complicated, of course, than uh, just an air conditioner. And for those days in the winter when it gets below 20 degrees on mine, uh, then I have a gas furnace backup. So does it work in Lincoln? <laughs> That's the question that most often comes. And I've heard from people that um, some contractors, not to be, you know, badmouth them, but some contractors uh, would say, don't use a heat pump in Lincoln because, you know, it works really well in Florida where it doesn't get that cold, but it doesn't work in Lincoln. Yeah, it works in Lincoln and also Minnesota, <laughs> if you look at those handouts. Um, and they're getting better and better all the time. So why plan ahead? And that's really the theme of all of this. Educate yourself in advance. Um, if you've ever owned a house long enough and it's 103 degrees and the air conditioner goes out, <laughs> you don't say, okay, I'm gonna take the next week and I'm gonna research and I'm gonna find the best deal and I'm gonna decide to do this. You want action right now. So uh, we know that that happens. Also with the furnace, if it's 20 degrees below zero and your furnace goes out, you call the uh, contractor right away and you make some pretty quick decisions. Um, so we're urging you today to learn about heat pumps so that when, we're, we're not saying get rid of your old furnace and your old air conditioner and replace it right now. We're saying when things go bad, you will know what you're talking about and you will have done some research into it. We, we have a lot to cover, so I think we'll move on to, to Benny. And there will be time at the end um, to uh, ask additional questions. So, Benny. Thank you, Gene. Good morning. My name is Benny Show. B-E-N-N-I-E-S-H-O-B-E. -E and I am very lucky, very blessed, very honored to be a member of your Lincoln City Council. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. In the essence of efficiency and energy conservation, I'm not going to say a whole lot. Many of the things I want to talk about, Kim will talk about in her presentation. I'm mostly focusing on trying to represent you and the climate action plan. When I'm at home at night, curled up in the fetal position, sometimes crying, sometimes not crying, <laughs> I think about the future and what's going to be here, and it scares me. And then I think, what can I do about it? So I end up never, th you know, never throwing any trash away. Everything's recyclable and all these things, and some of them are mentally challenging. Then I get up and I get dressed, get showered, stop crying, and I get to be your city councilman for a few hours. And we have a lovely thing called the Climate Action Plan. Kim, we'll talk about that more later. And I keep saying, what can we do? Now, I'm like this guy on the corner here. I'm a solar panel guy. How come we can't put solar panels on every city building downtown? And I get told, we'll get there. Go slow. We'll get there. I'm going, I, I'm struggling with this. I don't want to go slow. And so I'm looking for something to do in this Climate Action Plan to make some inroads to do something positive. I get to do the politics of this. So it's negotiating, trying to do trade-offs with my fellow city council people. What can we do that will have the most benefit, have the least impact on the budget, and move us in the right direction? I can somewhat influence things that the city does. But the Climate Action Plan is also your action plan, and that's why we're here today. There are things that you as residents of our community can do. We want to talk more about those over the next few minutes, next few days, next few years. We can do things to make our climate better, to make our planet better, to leave it better than we found it. It took us a long time to get here. We're not going to fix it all this weekend, but we don't get to sit on our hands and do nothing. Let's do something today. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to do this. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. We're going to keep trying to push forward. One of the things that's really good is that the mayor, city council, city government, now has an environmental, I'm going to get the title wrong, chief sustainability officer. I got to work with this young woman and a young man named John Carlson. I said, I want to do these things, and they both helped me 
get it in the budget where it needed to be so we could do it. It's about teamwork, cooperation, and working together. And here's the downside. I said I was going to stop talking, but I, you know, give a politician a microphone. Do they ever stop? <laughs> Almost everybody in the room is already in agreement with us or on board. They think it's a good idea. They want to know how. Uh, we have to help our friends in the community understand the importance of this. And our first instinct usually is to tell them, you have to do this. I have a younger sibling, and my sister says, I don't want you to tell me how to do things. I know how to do stuff. Stop telling me what to do. Here's what you need to do. She doesn't like hearing that. We have to come up with a better message and invite our friends to join us. Don't challenge them. Work with them. Build positive relationships and bring our friends and allies to make, create them as friends and allies. Convert them. I encourage you to do that. Talk positively about it. Don't bully people. Don't yell at them. Don't, tell, don't say, you don't understand. You have to do this. Usually when people tell me you don't understand, I stop listening. And I'm sure you do too at some point. Find a better way to encourage people to join us in doing what we can to mitigate climate change and build a better community for everybody. Guys, thank you. I'll be sitting here for a while. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and Roman, my friend, Kim Morrow, Chief Sustainability <laughs> Officer. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is such a great turnout this morning. We're happy to talk about heat pumps with you all. So I want to talk about the city uh, program that we have designed uh, for our heat pump incentives. But before I get to all those details, I wanted to just say a word about our climate action plan. Um, in case you um, aren't aware, we did adopt a climate action plan in 2021, three years ago. And it lays out a set of 118 actions for us to take as a, as a whole community to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and Im increase our resilience to extreme weather events. Um, and it is a plan for the whole community. It's not just for a municipal government. Um, so I want to underscore something Benny just said, that this is a plan for our whole community, and it's more than the city or any one of us can accomplish on our own. So um, I would encourage you to take a look at it. You can see it online. If you go to lincoln.ne.gov and search for uh, the Climate Action Plan, you, you'll find it. Um, but there, there are lots of ways that all of us can play a role, and actually installing heat pumps is one way um, that we can get involved in the Climate Action Plan. But just to say a quick word about the way the climate is changing and the, the kind of things that Lincoln will be facing in the future, um, we're looking at by 2050, our weather will be on average about five degrees warmer throughout the year. Um, <coughs> and some days that might seem like a good thing, but I always try to liken it to when you have a body temperature, when you have a fever. And if you just have a, a couple of degrees above your normal body temperature, you know that something's really wrong. And if it's five, six degrees above, well, five degrees above normal, you're probably going to the hospital, right? Because it's, it's all those interconnected systems are off balance. So it's kind of more akin to that when we're talking about ecological systems and how they're all interconnected. Um, we're gonna have more heat. 44 days annually is predicted with a heat index of over 100 degrees. Um, and that, that has real implications for public health. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, extreme heat is the leading, is the uh, most lethal climate impact, actually, more than flooding, more than hurricanes. It's actually extreme heat. Um, we are predicted to have more precipitation in winter and spring, and more precipitation falling in the form of rain rather than snow, because it will be a little bit warmer, and so precipitation that would have fallen as snow in previous years is gonna be more likely to fall as rain. And then we're also gonna have an increase in e heavy precipitation events. Um, so you've probably experienced some of those extreme downpours where all of a sudden we just get a ton of rain falling in a short amount of time. So that we'll probably be seeing more of that. We did an assessment of the risks that we face as a city and these are the, the top risks that came that came through the the t first three are the most important and they all have to do with water so we're going to experience more problems of having both too much water and not enough water at different times and you can even see in the last few years we're already swinging between these extremes right in the in 2019 we had the bomb cyclone event we had major flooding problems we almost had a water crisis here because our heat, our water pumps went out in Ashland 
And then a few years later, most much of the state was plunged into an extreme drought situation. So these, ex you know, we are we're used to extremes in Nebraska, but those extremes are going to get more extreme and switch back and forth even more. So to say a word about our greenhouse gas emissions, this is where our greenhouse gas emissions came from as of 2020. So the largest sector is electricity for now, but I will say that piece of the pie has been decreasing um, a lot because of the great efforts that LES has done to add renewable energy to their portfolio. They have actually reduced emissions 36% since 2010, I believe it is. Um, so they're making a lot of progress. Um, our second largest category is transportation, followed by natural gas and then miscellaneous. And this shows our greenhouse gas emissions since 2011. You can see they are going down, but um, they're not going down far enough or fast enough to meet the kind of global targets the world has set to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So um, the Climate Action Plan, let's see, I think it's the next slide, yep. These are the eight areas that the Climate Action Plan is divided into. So these are the, the sectors that, that I'm working toward and that we're working toward as a city to address. So energy, transportation, economic development, um, protections means basically climate resilience, protecting our, our population, local food, natural climate solutions, waste, and community engagement. So the way that, the, that we see climate climate action, it's more than just, I mean, obviously reducing greenhouse gas emissions is extremely important, but it's also more than that. It's really a holistic approach to how do we create economic opportunity? How do we relocalize our food system? How do we protect public health? Um, how do we engage our community? It's, it's almost like we're in a um, crisis situation and we have the opportunity to, to reinvent ourselves or to re improve our relationship with nature and with one another. And so it's really a broad, a broad view of how we do that. Mm. There is a, a, a big, hairy, audacious goal, as they say, in the Climate Action Plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. So that is what we are working toward. We also have some other goals in there. Um, well, LES set a goal that they will have net zero emissions from electricity generation by 2040. Uh, we want to have our municipal buildings be net zero by 2040, and we are working to transition our fleet, the, the vehicles that the city owns, to 100% alternative fuel by 2040. Um, these are a couple of the projects that we are currently working on. Um, we're deep into a climate pollution reduction grant program from the EPA. The flyer that I handed out um, has more information. We're currently doing some town halls and a survey that we would invite you to participate in. Um, we're asking for residents' feedback on some of the priority measures we could take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So love to have your input on that. We also adopted a local food system plan last summer, also adopted an EV readiness plan last summer. We're about to start on a project to develop an energy management plan for our municipal buildings. Um, we have a biochar initiative, um, working on decarbonizing our fleet. It's just a lot, <laughs> a lot of fun stuff going on. So to get into more specifics about the heat pump program, um, we announced this program on January 4th, uh, last month. Um, and actually, that's the public part of the program. Last year, what we started with is we had a consultant do some study and analysis for us. And so I wanted to share just a few things that the consultants um, found in their study that helped us design the program. So they, they analyzed the housing stock that we have in Lincoln and our demographics. We have 126,000 housing units in Lincoln. Um, on the upper right, you can see 58% are owner-occupied, 42% are renter-occupied. So we have a really significant rental population in town. It's important to keep that in mind. Um, but 58% of our homes are single family. And let's see, I won't go through all of these, but um, under existing HVAC, you can see 64% of our homes use utility gas, 34% use um, electricity, and 2% other sources. So, um, you know, not surprisingly, most HVAC systems that people have are using um, natural gas for their um, heating needs. 
Um, this is residential energy use across Nebraska. You can see this is just energy usage, so this would be electricity and natural gas. But space heating is there in the blue. So 33 percent of our um, of our energy use goes to to space heating, and the red section is water heating. So there's a lot um, a lot of energy going into heating heating needs across the state. That means there's an opportunity to make some changes there too. Um, so this slide shows um, the comparison in fuel costs and life cycle, uh, 15 year life fuel costs between um, an air source heat pump or a um, air conditioning natural gas setup, which would be more a more traditional setup. So um, you can see in the table that the <coughs> annual fuel costs for an air source heat pump, granted fuel cost means electricity cost also. So that would be $729 compared to $819 for a traditional system. And the 15-year life cost would be $10,935 for an air source heat pump compared to $12,285 for a traditional system. Um, in terms of the carbon dioxide reduction, <coughs> the um, annual reduction from an air source heat pump is 2.87 tons of carbon dioxide. And over a 15-year lifespan, that would equate to 43. No, that doesn't. That's not over 15 years. Uh, it's just lifetime. I'm not sure what a lifetime span is. But 43 tons of CO2 over a lifetime. Um, so the average difference in cost between the two systems is approximately $1,700. And the 15-year difference in energy cost is approximately $1,350. Um, and so here, again, um, the annual CO2 reduction for just one air source heat pump would be 2.87 tons. But if, you know, as we were thinking of designing this program, if we could get 100 people to convert to air source heat pumps, that would equal 287 tons of CO2. Or if we got 250, that would be 710 tons. Um, and then you can see the equivalent numbers over the lifetime that adds up. Um, it's still not significant numbers compared to all of our greenhouse gas emissions as a community, but it's still an important step in the right direction. So to describe our particular program in detail, um, it launched January 4th. The goals are to help residents save money, to um, increase home heating and cooling efficiency, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we, the city is offering a $1,000 incentive for the general population or a $3,000 incentive for low and moderate income residents. Um, and whether, you, whether someone qualifies for low and moderate income, uh, they have to be 80, their annual income has to be 80% of the area median income, which I don't have that figure right at my fingertips, but it's a federal guideline. We do have a worksheet on our website. It depends how large your household size is, but you can look at the table and see if you might qualify. Um, and then you could work with our, our team in urban development, uh, the urban development department, um, to qualify for that incentive. But th either of these can be stacked with LES's existing $800 incentive and the federal tax rebate of 30%. So um, low-income folks could get a maximum of $3,800 plus a 30% tax credit um, or $1,800 plus a 30%. So it's a pretty generous um, incentive altogether who is eligible homeowners or single family rental property owners in the city of Lincoln we have to be within city boundaries. We decided to start this program just with single family at this point. So we certainly want to approach the commercial sector and the multifamily sector, but we're just starting, um, even though it's a half a million dollars, it's the, we expect the funds to go fairly quickly. So um, we're, we're starting, starting this way. Um, and the second bullet is what I just mentioned. The website, if you are, if you think you might be low and in moderate income, go to lincolnne.gov slash housing support, and you can look up that table and see if you qualify. So what's included? Purchase and installation of air source heat pumps. Heat pumps must replace an existing heat pump or air conditioner that is at least five years old, or it can replace a gas furnace but please consult with a qualified HVAC contractor to find out what is the best option for your particular home. And we do have um, heat pump ratings that, the, that must be met for the program. 
Um, you can see there's a CR2 of 15.2 and an ER2 of 12. Those are just high efficiency ratings. Mark could explain more about what the, that, those mean if you're interested. So what's not included, any home outside of Lincoln City limits, commercial, multifamily housing. Um, this is also not for ground source heat pumps. Ground source heat pumps are awesome, but again, we just decided to focus for now on air source heat pumps. And new residential is not included as well right now. So how does the program work? It's super easy, um, thanks to the design that LES already had in place. Um, so basically, you would contact your HVAC contractor and say, hey, I'd like to put in a new heat pump. And your contractor takes care of the rest, basically. They have, they're enrolled in a program through LES, and um, LES will give the incentive to them, and your discount will just show up as a discount on your invoice that you would get from your HVAC contractor. So you can go to les.com slash SEP to see the list of participating HVAC contractors and more information about the program. You can also email SEP at les.com with any questions. Um, so you would just contact one of those um, HVAC contractors for to get a bid. You might want to get a couple of bids. Um, and then you just install your, your new heat pump and you're ready to go. In terms of the funds we have available, um, the total funds, uh, after we paid the consultant for the initial study that I mentioned, we have $457,000 to give away to Lincoln residents. And this um, table is, as of uh, Thursday, we've given about, um, I don't have the actual number, I think it's about, it's between 15 and 20, I believe, total number of incentives so far. The blue is how much we've given out and the orange is how much is left. So you can see there's still quite a lot left to go and we'd love to give some of that to you if you are if you qualify. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll turn it over to Mark Skolnick now. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> so if I, as I stand up here, I can only imagine what Taylor Swift must feel like at a concert <laughs> looking out about this group. I mean, it's amazing. Look at all these people here. I'm blown away. The, well, no, there's no resemblance, or Travis for that matter. I, I can't purport to be Travis, but to look out here and to see how many people are here to, uh, to learn more about heat pumps is, is pretty incredible. Let me talk to you a little bit about air source heat pumps, and I'm not gonna try not to repeat everything you've just heard because there's a lot of good information that's already been shared, but I did wanna share a couple numbers that I ran. Notice, first of all, that a heat pump and an air conditioner almost look identical because they pretty much are, and Ken kind of mentioned that. You will see a heat pump sometimes raised up because it defrosts, so it needs a place for some of that. You know, as it defrosts, it, it can drip down and, and, and not uh, be on the ground when it does that, but they're really one and the same, except the heat pump is capable of heating much more efficiently. And so the first system here is an air conditioner and gas furnace. And this is the annual therms that are used um, and the electric costs. And that would be the, I'm sorry, that's the air conditioner paired with a gas furnace and the projected CO2 emissions for that system. And we're, we're assuming this is an 80% efficient gas furnace we know that you can get more efficient systems up to 95 plus plus percent. And then that's the latest therm cost from Black Hill, 74 cents, and about a nickel, a kilowatt hour from LES for winter rates. And then if you compare, if you combine that, if you replace that air conditioner with an air source heat pump and, and keep your gas furnace, your electricity consumption will will rise to about 6,000 kilowatt hours for heating. That's just for heating, 190 therms. So you can see a pretty dramatic decrease in gas and an annual heating cost of $364, $110 savings annually, and a pretty dramatic drop in CO2 emissions. So that's air conditioner and gas furnace versus air source heat pump and gas furnace. If we do an air conditioner and electric furnace, you can see 
you have a significant electric load, 15,000 kilowatt hours a year, uh, $750 annual heating cost, just heating, and over 18,000 pounds of CO2. When you switch that air conditioner with a heat pump, look at the dramatic decrease in electric consumption over half, and you cut your annual heating cost by $450. And your CO2 emissions drop precipitously to about a third. The technology works. Technology works. Um, first one went in in 1975, so this isn't novel. The heat pump's been around a long time. Now what is more recent is the advances, the variable speed equipment that makes it more efficient. Okay, it's improved. They do extract heat in Minnesota. They do extract heat in Maine. But you do need an auxiliary heater. The best case in point is what we just in endured two weeks ago when we might as well have been living at the North Pole, right? Okay, the heat pump will not provide sufficient heating in those elements. And if, you're, and if you've been studying the patterns of weather, that seems to be the new winter normal. Warm Decembers, a polar vortex that knocks your socks off for two weeks, and then a return to warmer than normal weather, which we're about ready to go into, we are into, okay? So it's getting through the bitterly cold. The heat pump technologies aren't there to get us through minus 18 degrees. <laughs> so you need auxiliary heat. You need auxiliary heat. So the Inflation Reduction Act has been mentioned as a way, because be, I talked about the crossing the chasm, and I talked about, first of all, there's the, the miseducation that folks have about heat pumps, that they don't work in really cold weather. Heat pump is an odd term, because it doesn't explain that it's an air conditioner and a heat source, but whatever. But cost is another big one. So that's being addressed through the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in 2022, um, it's the IRA's overall objectives were to invest in clean energy technologies, actually reduce healthcare costs. This is all at the highest levels of, of the act itself. Um, but their energy-related objectives was to promote zero carbon generation and energy efficiency, promote electrification, and provide su uh, financial support targeted to low and moderate income households. Domestic manufacturing, right? You'll see that, particularly in some of the EV incentives, you need to have, to get the rebate, they have to be domestically sourced, minerals in the battery, and it all has to be assembled here, and this is all trying to jumpstart technology and manufacturing supply chains here domestically. So as it relates to air source heat pumps, right now, today, 30% federal tax credit uh, up to $2,000 when you purchase a heat pump that meets the minimum seasonal energy efficiency ratio, SEER, um, and the, uh, those minimums are equivalent to what LES requires to get our incentive. So if you go to LES.com and you see the requirements, and your trade ally, your contractor will know what those are as well, it, it shouldn't be a mystery to you. Now, the city, LES, and the city's combo of incentives is $1,800. So the federal tax credit really is based on your tax liability, which is different for everybody. If you have no tax liability, then the credit really provides you with nothing. <laughs> it's not refundable. Somebody asks, is this refundable? No. You, you can't get money if you don't have the tax liability. But you definitely will get money if you meet the city's requirements and LES's requirements of $1,800. And from time to time, manufacturers have rebates. And then there is also, for financing, the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy has a low interest loan. Now, I want to also mention, and here's another innovator. <laughs> it was Kurt Donaldson that said a few years ago when we were doing our integrated resource plan at LES, 
you have to look at heat pump water heaters. You have to look at those. Those are impactful technologies and you need to consider providing an incentive. And we ran the numbers and he was right. 50% <laughs> savings in electric use when, when you put one of these bad boys in. It uses the same technology as an air source heat pump. It transfers heat. You have to have the right, you have to have the right space for it. It's a little bit larger unit, but, but they're really very capable un, un, uh, uh, technologies and they work tremendously well. I took a warm shower today by a heat pump water heater and it felt, felt great, felt great, okay? LES has an SCP incentive of $500 when you purchase a heat pump water heater. It's also eligible for a tax credit, 30% up to $2,000. Now, Ken alluded to the fact that down the road, there will be an additional program, and it is a point of sale rebate program, not a tax credit, where you literally, if you meet the income guidelines, will get a rebate at point of sale for the purchase of any of these technologies. That is being funded by the federal government, but administered by the state energy office. And they are in the process of designing that program. It's a big lift because all of these are point of sale. That means they have to create a system that verifies what your income is and then works with the contractors to provide point of sale. That's a fairly large lift, and that's why it may be until early 2025 when this rebate program goes live, but it will obviously be a potential game changer in helping us cross the chasm. Here are some resources. If you want to learn more about electrification and the move towards advanced technologies, Rewiring America is a great resource. Energy Star um, and all these others. LES.com is where you need to go to visit to learn more about heat pumps. I think Ken or somebody was trying to provide you my last name. Forget my last name. It's too hard to spell. SEP or LES.com is a lot easier. Just go there. But if you do need any assistance, my staff, myself, we're, we're here for you. We're your public power provider. And with that, I'd be happy to turn it over to Kurt. Uh, I am happy to be here uh, because I've been able to learn quite a bit uh, to get here today. I had to, had to learn some things. And I do have some breaking news that should go at the top of the sheet here. As I looked back on my history with heat pumps, I realized that, uh, I'll be talking about my own heat pump experience, but that in 1975, I had actually had installed in a house in Lincoln a heat pump in 1975, which is 49 years ago. An early adopter, yes. Except I, I didn't have to take the chances. So yesterday I made a cold call on that house just to see how things were going because I really hadn't been back there for the present owner. And a, a nice man came to the door and uh, uh, said that I'd worked on the house 50 years ago. And I asked him, uh, well, how's your heat pump doing? And uh, at that point, I didn't know what to expect. I thought he might say, well, you know, the first thing we did when we moved in here 30 years ago was to tear that damn thing out and, and put in a gas furnace. Uh, I just didn't know. But he responded that he still had the heat pump running. They'd replaced it once. He couldn't quite remember when, so I went to uh, Building and Safety, and uh, they had replaced it in 1975, the inside unit and the outside unit, which is 41 years. And... I think there probably was an outside unit replaced before then, but he didn't remember it, and he'd been there 30 years. So uh, the question is, do they last? Well, I guess that one does, and that's anecdotal data, uh, data of course, but if you put enough anecdotal data together, you get or anecdotal stories, you get data, and that's what I have on the rest of the sheet here is uh, data from my own experience uh, on mostly rental properties uh, with three different uh, HVAC sources. And uh, I'll just go through them very, very briefly, but uh, I'll say these are all uh, 
affordable housing, uh, all single family and duplexes, uh, all over 100 years old, that all have been upgraded with uh, insulation uh, as best I, I could get in the wall space. All the gas furnaces except one are 90% condensing furnaces. Uh, all the uh, air source heat pumps have electric backup. I don't believe in gas backup, and I can go into that in more detail. But anyway, uh, starting out on the natural gas furnaces, what I've done is I've, uh, I have gotten all the individual gas and electric costs, but I, I'm not listing them here. They're just combined electricity and gas for the entire unit, and that means lighting, computers, hot water, heating, everything. And to come up with a square footage for each unit, then you come up with an operating cost per square foot, your total energy operating cost per square foot per unit, and uh, that's a useful number. That's what Lincoln Public Schools does to see how they're performing on their buildings, and they have a range in costs from about $1.40 a square foot with the two remaining, two remaining gas schools down to about 50 cents a square foot for one of the uh, renovated middle schools. You, you can have quite a bit of difference, but anyway, you see here there's the cost for square foot difference of, from 234 a square foot down to 171. And the, uh, on the 2346 South 17th Street, that is a 648 square foot house. And the high bill there can be explained simply that it has got a large amount of uh, wall area to the square footage area. Uh, that's just, that's, that's I think what explains that. Now, going down onto the air source heat pumps, uh, you see that we have a cost range uh, from 124 down to 83 cents a square foot. And uh, this is interesting to show that uh, actual results may vary. And I, and I just want to talk about why that is on a couple of these things. And as I look at that, one of the biggest culprits of high costs with air source heat pump is that uh, if these are all electric units, the electric water heater is a killer, a resistance water heater. I'm probably spending more on the water heater than I am for heating, heating the property or the, the tenants. Uh, there is one here. Uh, you know, there, uh, and I'll get to that down in the geothermal uh, so source, that uh, the, wa the water heater is killing it. Anyway, uh, when we get down to uh, 1445 North 25th Street, that's kind of my, my star of the uh, air source heat bumps. It's a place that I'm working on right now. But as you can see, we've gotten square foot costs down... Uh, to 107 for the downstairs unit and 88 cents uh, for the upstairs unit. And uh, anyway, so coming down to the conclusions, if you look at that, as we say on this sheet up there, uh, I believe you can argue that the air source units operate at 54% of the cost of natural gas units, or a, a differential of uh, 86 cents a square foot. And so my performance numbers between uh, uh, natural gas and uh, heat pumps are, are better than have been argued by these people here. And I have trouble arguing with those, but these are, these are my numbers. And uh, we have not sub-metered any of these uh, units, but by inference, you say, what is the main difference between these units? and it's uh, the source on, on their heating, and uh, one is a heat pump and one is natural gas. And interesting thing is that when you look at the natural gas versus the heat pump, there is no overlap in the costs. The worst air source heat pump is better than, than, the, than the best natural gas. So there's something going on there with efficiency. And uh, what you can say is that air source does pretty good. And, and in comparison to how I feel about geothermal, there, there's one saying is that the, the good is enemy to the best. And, that, and that's if uh, air source is good, geothermal is the best, but I think it's probably wise to, uh, try, to try to do the good. Uh, for example, 
in this room here, we are now on uh, air source heat pump for the last two months. We just, just put these in. We did that instead of going with the geothermal, which we have for the rest of the building. And uh, it seemed like the right choice, and I could go into more detail on that. But anyway, to sum up, why, why do air source heat pumps do so well? And, and the way I look at it is there is such a thing as a free lunch. I've, I've, there is. <laughs> they say there isn't, but don't, don't believe it. You've got, to, you've got to believe that there is a free lunch or you'll never get it. So, you know, with, with air source heat pumps, it's hard to believe that they, they get heat out of the air in the winter. You know, I don't really understand it. Uh, I'd rather get the heat out of the air in the summer and put it into the ground like geothermal, like the good Lord intends. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is there is energy in cold air because it is a long way down to absolute zero, which is 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, with the right heat pumps, you could extract heat right on down there. You could heat on the moon with heat pumps, which is only about, it goes down to about 212 degrees minus Fahrenheit on, in, on the dark side. So, you know, stuff works. Uh, that's all I can say. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah. Yeah.